Hello Booktube, I'm Jonathan, and here are my 25 favourite sci-fi books. Number 25, Waystation by Clifford D. Simak. Waystation tells the story of the seemingly ageless Enoch Wallace that lives as a recluse on a farm that is secretly an intergalactic Waystation. The first thing I fell in love with about Waystation was the writing style. It vividly describes a particular time and place in a poetic and concise way. It's thought-provoking and it contains an array of concepts, but the ideas never feel overwhelming because they're conveyed in a calm and considered manner. I enjoyed the story and characters in Waystation, but I felt like its biggest strength was its thematic depth. The way that Simak explores war and technology and society and relationships were things that I really connected with. I would recommend Waystation to all science fiction readers, especially if you're looking for an ideas-driven story with beautiful prose. Number 24, To Your Scattered Bodies Go by Philip Jose Farmer. In the book To Your Scattered Bodies Go, a famous adventurer dies then wakes up on a seemingly endless river alongside billions of other humans plus a few non-humans. This book is a little weird, a little absurd, and wildly imaginative. It has a slightly psychedelic feel to it, as well as an intriguing mystery. What is this strange river world, and where exactly does the river lead to? It's also a fun adventure that brings together a varied cast of characters in order to figure out the secrets of a river world. I think the book could have benefited from some more three-dimensional female characters, but nonetheless, I still enjoyed this group getting together and trying to figure out the secrets, put together the pieces of this puzzle. I also enjoyed the thematic journey. It's a unique setting to drop these characters into and then see what they've learned from their previous lives or whether they repeat the mistakes of human history. Overall, I found this to be a philosophically rewarding look at an individual's journey as well as the trajectory of mankind. Number 23. The Road by Cormac McCarthy. In The Road, we follow a father and son as they travel together across a post-apocalyptic America. This book has a handful of really gripping scenes, but for the most part, it's a very simple story. So how did Cormac McCarthy have such a big emotional impact on me with this book? Well, it tackles several existential questions, such as what reasons are there to choose to be a good person? And what does it mean to be a good father? And whether questions like these even have any meaning in a post-apocalyptic world. I was also impacted by the experiences of this young boy. I was rooting for moments of light in a world where he has only ever experienced suffering and darkness. McCarthy's prose and the way he plays with grammar might not appeal to everyone, but I was thoroughly impressed by the way he was able to capture the mundanity of life, but the profundity of existence. For me, reading The Road was emotionally impactful. I don't have any children, but after I finished reading The Road, I did feel the need to hug my dog. Number 22, Dying Inside by Robert Silverberg. Dying Inside follows David Selleck, a neurotic and insecure man with the powers of telepathy. Powers that are fading and he is squandered. David isn't the most relatable character, at times he's downright unlikable, as he can be selfish and ignorant. But the experiences of aging, the loss of time, and the loss of self are all universal. While this book is an interesting exploration of the ability of telepathy, it's also an examination of the experience of any talent or natural ability that has gone to waste, and the toll that that takes on our relationships and our identity. David can make mental connections at will, so he craves physical connections, but as his powers start to fade, it becomes clear that he never learned how to make emotional connections. It's a rather bleak story, but perhaps one of caution rather than complete hopelessness. Okay, books to read in space. Is that? Did I bring Blindsight? Of course I brought Blindsight. Number 21, Blindsight by Peter Watts. In Blindsight, there's a mission to track down the source of a message heard in space. On board, there is a character with half a brain, a character with multiple personalities, and a vampire. But Blindsight isn't so much a story about a space mission or even these individual characters. It's a story about consciousness itself. When you add robot soldiers and an artificially intelligent spaceship, the book features a range of different levels of intelligence and consciousness. Watts then examines the differences between those and asks the chilling question whether consciousness is even a good thing. Blindsight includes some hard science and doesn't hold your hand with the world building. Certain elements of the narrative you have to pick up through context clues or through revelations later in the book. This isn't necessarily a book where I loved the entire reading experience, but the last hundred pages of Blindsight hit me like a stake 
through the heart. And I haven't been able to stop thinking about this book since I finished it. Number 20, The Children of Men by P. D. James. In The Children of Men, humanity has become infertile. So as time passes and people pass away, there are no babies being born to replace them. So how does this affect a society for which there is no future? The Children of Men is a thematic and character-driven story. The plot churns along, but it's a churning that I felt in my soul. James's writing is cold and sobering, and it instills a sense of hopelessness and pointlessness. And this takes a toll on our characters' sense of self, their relationships, and their spirituality. And yet, a small group of them find a reason to live and a way to survive. For me, The Children of Men was a poetic examination of people, power, and purpose. Number 19, Ring by Stephen Baxter. In the book Ring, a wormhole has been looped back on itself, ripping a hole in time. From the far future came an urgent message. The universe was doomed, but humankind was not. Just quickly before we get into this one, I'll mention that Ring is the fourth book in Baxter's Zeely sequence, but it can be read as a standalone. So this book puts the space in space opera and the hard in hard sci-fi. The concepts are mind-boggling and the scope is simply enormous. To illustrate this, the story takes place over millions of years. Baxter explores a ton of exciting ideas, including dark matter, cosmic strings, and time dilation. And he does so in great detail. You will find several exchanges of dialogue along the lines of character A. So it kind of works like this, right? Character B. Well, actually, insert massive info dump here. And while that might not be the most effective way to tell a story, it still worked because the characters had some personality, the story was exciting, and the ideas were absolutely nutty. When I finished this book, I felt like my brain had been shattered into a million pieces and put back together again. Number 18, Flowers for Algernon by Daniel Keyes. Flowers for Algernon is the story of Charlie, a man with a low IQ who undergoes an experimental surgery in order to improve his intelligence after it was successfully performed on a mouse. It works, but soon the mouse starts to regress. The first thing you'll notice about Flowers for Algernon is the structure and writing style. The story is told through journal entries that are written by Charlie. At first, these contain a limited vocabulary and are riddled with spelling and grammar errors. But as Charlie's intelligence increases, he becomes more eloquent and articulate. So we're able to learn more about Charlie, not just through the narrative, but also through the medium itself. The surgery is an interesting premise through which to explore what makes someone who they really are and what defines their personality, as well as the differences between intelligence and emotional intelligence. And it also questions how we deal with repressed memories and the treatment of the mentally challenged, as well as the ethics of medicine. This is an emotional book and one that left me an absolute mess at the end of it. Number 17, Ubik by Philip K. Dick. In Ubik, a security team is ambushed, and the surviving members of the team start to experience strange changes in the nature of time and reality. They also keep hearing about a mysterious store-bought product named Ubik. At this point in the video, I'll mention that I limited this list to one entry per author. A Scanner Darkly is another Philip K. D. book that I strongly considered, but in the end, I went with Ubik. Ubik is a book that intrigued me initially, but didn't fully hook me in right away. But once the shifts in reality started to happen, I just didn't want to put this book down. It does an excellent job of posing questions and then giving you answers, or at least theories. You're never exactly sure what exactly is the next piece in the puzzle, or a red herring. The matter-of-fact way that Philip K. Dick delivers surreal information leaves us, the readers, just as confused as the characters. Characters which at times can be rather entertaining. I also found the book to be thematically satisfying. The themes of consumerism, drugs, mental health, and spirituality all combine perfectly to deliver a story that is both head-scratching and enlightening. Number 16, More Than Human by Theodore Sturgeon. More Than Human is about a group of characters, some of them with disabilities but also supernatural abilities, and it follows their evolution, as well as that of humanity. This is an ambitious book that plays with time and structure. The book is split into three parts, and there was at least one moment during each of those three parts where I thought to myself, hmm, I'm not really sure where this is going, which was then typically followed shortly after by, I can't believe Sturgeon pulled all of this together. I found this to be a poignant book, particularly in its depiction of loneliness and the sensations of not feeling whole. 
It uses a scientific concept to explore the nature of family and friendships. And while it does rely on a tiny bit of exposition, I found it to be intellectually and emotionally rewarding. I'm so hot in this suit. I'm dying. Number 15, The Dark Forest by Sishin Liu. This is the second book in the Remembrance of Earth's Past trilogy, so just to avoid spoilers, I'll give you the premise for book one, which is, strange things start happening to prominent scientists. Oddities which could be linked to a secret project that is sending messages out into space. I loved all three books in the series, but I particularly enjoyed book two, The Dark Forest, and book three, Death's End. The ideas in Death's End are almost guaranteed to melt your mind. But I picked The Dark Forest for this list because of the sheer volume of story ideas. Sishin Liu came up with concepts for about 10 different books, and he combined them into one. And every time I thought I knew what direction the plot was going, he'd either resolve that story thread or take it in a completely different direction. And all of this builds towards the Dark Forest theory, which is thoroughly chilling. If you like hard sci-fi, it doesn't get much bigger and better than this series. Number 14, Spin by Robert Charles Wilson. What if one day all the stars disappeared? Spin asks this question as well as what would that would mean for the survival of humanity, as well as the relationships of three best friends. Spin combines some of my favorite aspects of science fiction. It has a big high concept premise, and it's full of hard science, but it also tells a personal story. The characters are a little tropey, for example, you're the scientific one, and you're the spiritual one. But the relationship dynamics are engaging, and they tie into the big ideas and themes of the story. The central mystery hooks you in, but Wilson does a good job of not dragging out that one idea. Instead, he crafts a compelling story that is constantly upping the stakes. This is one of those rare books that grabbed my attention, and I didn't want to miss a single word from start to finish. Number 13, Dark Matter by Blake Crouch. Dark Matter follows Jason, a man that gets abducted, and when he wakes up, the world appears to be the same, but things aren't quite right. His wife isn't his wife, his son was never born, and instead of being a college professor, he's a celebrated physicist. Dark Matter isn't as thematically heavy as some of the other books on this list, but it makes up for that in pure entertainment. The pacing of this book is rapid, and I burn through the pages. Crouch uses some interesting scientific concepts and uses them to drive the story, and he describes them in a digestible way, which helps maintain the tension and the pacing in this thriller of a book. I cared about the characters in Dark Matter, but I don't feel like character development was the main focus of the book. To me, it felt less like a television show and more like a film, where the big high concept premise and the cinematic moments were the driving forces behind the story. I think this one would be a blast for both experienced readers of the genre, as well as newer readers to science fiction. Number 12, Children of Time by Adrian Tchaikovsky. In Children of Time, humans attempt to speed up the colonization of a planet using a nanovirus, but something goes wrong. The spiders on that planet become intelligent. The book alternates between two storylines. It follows the survival story of humans living on a generation ship trying to find a planet to land on as well as following the cultural and technological evolution of the spiders. I enjoyed the human storyline, but I was fascinated with the spiders. I loved seeing how their intelligence affected the trajectory of their evolution and the ways in which it was both similar and different to that of humans. I enjoyed the space opera elements as well as the themes that Tchaikovsky incorporated. I found it really interesting to see the ways in which spirituality was influenced by one's environment, as well as the way that different generations of species were connected. This was a book that I really liked, and then it turned into something truly special with its final act. Number 11, Demon in White by Christopher Rocchio. This is book three in the Sun Eater series. There are currently five books available, I've thoroughly enjoyed all of them, and the series will conclude after seven books. To avoid spoilers, I'll give you the premise for book one, Empire of Silence. Thousands of years in the future, Hadrian Marlow destroys a sun, killing billions and wiping out an entire alien race. He recounts his story, and we follow the journey of a man that is regarded by some as a hero, and others a monster. Rocchio is a wonderful writer. He's an absolute master with the pen. Or quill. I imagine he might be the type of writer that uses a quill. Demon in White expands the world, the political machinations are well-crafted, and the story is action-packed. This is Sword and Planet sci-fi at its absolute best, and it contains one of my all-time favorite fight scenes. We also get some fantastic character development in this book. 
The story takes place over an incredibly long period of time, and we really feel the characters age and their relationships change. Sun Eater introduces some weird and ambitious sci-fi concepts earlier in the series, and Demon and White takes them and makes them even bigger and better. This is far and away my favourite current sci-fi series. And just quickly, before we get to our top 10, if you enjoy discussing sci-fi, feel free to join us on Discord. I'll be talking about some of my other favourites, maybe share some honourable mentions on Discord, and if you really enjoy the content and want to support the channel so I can do things like rent astronaut suits for videos, then consider becoming a Patreon member, where you can become one of my robots, androids, or cyborgs like Nima and a New Eden. Number 10, Solaris by Stanislav Lem. In Solaris, Chris Kelvin arrives at an ocean planet and finds himself and the crew plagued with repressed and newly real memories. The first thing I liked about Solaris was the tone and atmosphere. It's creepy and surreal and mysterious, and it really heightens the experience of searching for the secrets of this mysterious ocean planet. I also enjoyed the process of Kelvin trying to decipher what was real, who he could trust, and whether he could even trust himself. Lem does rely on a few info dumps, but for the most part, I thought he brilliantly weaved together the scientific ideas with the philosophical elements. There's this incredible back and forth between conquering the external without yet fully understanding the internal. Number 9, Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. You know the story, but Victor Frankenstein gives life to a being of his own creation. Unfortunately, he finds him hideous, and the creature flees into the wilderness. But is he really a monster? Frankenstein is a fantastic read over 200 years after its release because of its wonderful prose, its powerful characters, and its timeless themes. It took me a few chapters to get into the writing style, but once I did, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I loved the lavish descriptions and the emotional outpourings. I actually quite liked Victor Frankenstein as a character, despite his hubris and impulsiveness, because I found him to be a rather engaging character, one that thought and felt deeply. But Frankenstein's monster is the highlight of the book. He's not this groaning, lumbering oaf as he's so often depicted. He's actually articulate and philosophical and lonely. And Shelley did an impressive job of weaving these two character arcs together with the themes of failure and grief and regret. I really felt both characters' sense of despair or desire for revenge. If you haven't read it, it's never too late to read Frankenstein. Number 8, Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir. In Project Hail Mary, our main character Rylan Grace wakes up with memory loss. He appears to be on a space mission and something's gone wrong. I loved both Project Hail Mary and The Martian. I slightly preferred the setting in The Martian, but I ended up choosing Project Hail Mary for this list due to its larger scope and for its characters. The pacing in this book is fantastic. I accidentally bought a large print copy of Project Hail Mary, so it felt like I was flying through the pages even more so. It consistently adds more obstacles for our characters to overcome, and it contains some amazing reveals later in the book. Weir does a great job of integrating the science into the story. He makes it feel fun like a magic system, and it gives us a better sense of the problems that Ryland faces and the ingenious ways that he solves them. This might not be the most ambitious book in terms of its themes, but it nails the story it wants to tell. When it comes to the action, the comedy, the characters, and the concepts, this is a thoroughly entertaining that I think will land for both new and old sci-fi readers. Number 7, 1984 by George Orwell. In the book, Winston Smith works for the Ministry of Truth, but secretly dreams of rebellion. This leads him to a shadowy resistance group known as the Brotherhood. I enjoyed reading all of the dystopian classics, but for me, 1984 was the one that had the largest emotional impact. For me, it created the most tension, the highest stakes, and it ended with a nuclear bomb to my soul. 1984 created an iconic world with Big Brother and the Thought Police. It's a truly scary world for our characters to live in, and while Julia and Winston weren't necessarily the most likeable characters, they were characters that I was interested in and I was surprised by. The themes of surveillance, nationalism, and propaganda transcend time and place. It's a thematically rich book, and the wonderful storytelling heightens the poignancy of those ideas. Number 6, Childhood's End by Arthur C. Clarke. In Childhood's End, alien spaceships arrive at Earth. At first it's scary, but Without any further development, it starts to become more mysterious. Are they friend or foe, or something else? This is a brilliant ideas-driven book. 
It takes a zoomed out look at humanity, so while there are some memorable characters, the story is more focused on big ideas that affect humanity as a whole. One of my favourite ideas in this book is what happens to a society when it takes a large technological leap? What does that do to things like culture and art? This book contains some hard sci-fi elements, but it also imagines what exists outside the boundaries of science, or at least our current understanding of it. It's also just a brilliant first contact story that questions the place of humans within the universe. The depiction of the aliens ties into the narrative itself, and I think that's wonderfully layered story writing. The book is split into three parts. I enjoyed the first, the second expanded my mind, and the third blew it to smithereens. Wait, what? Charlie? You snuck onto the spaceship? What are you doing here? You wanna go to space? All right. Let's go to space, I guess. Number five, The Fall of Hyperion by Dan Simmons. This is the second book in the Hyperion duology, so I'll give you the premise for the first book, Hyperion. Seven pilgrims travel to the planet of Hyperion in order to visit the Time Tombs, which are traveling backwards in time and are guarded by the mysterious and deadly Shrike. The Fall of Hyperion doesn't have the Canterbury Tales-like structure from Hyperion, and it does take about 100 pages to get going, but once it does, I think it really delivers as a space opera and on the story being told in the present timeline. Simmons makes a couple of strange choices in this book, but I can forgive them all because of the high, high, high points. There were several times while reading this book that I stopped and thought to myself, this is why I read science fiction. The level of imagination here is one of the great achievements in the genre, and it has one of my all-time favourite sci-fi concepts in The Void Which Binds. Simmons introduces a new character that is somewhat of a love letter to the poet John Keats, and some of the character resolutions are kind of head scratches, but others are complete jaw droppers and absolute tear jerkers. The scene from the cover art of this book is one of my favourite chapters that I've ever read. If you pick up Hyperion, please read The Fall of Hyperion as well. They're two halves to the same story and they deserve to be read together. Number four, Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card. In Ender's Game, humanity is at war with an alien species. Fearing an invasion, the international fleet recruits gifted children and trains them to become commanders at battle school. Ender's Game combines some of the best elements of military sci-fi with a coming of age story. I found the tactical training battles as well as the character development to both be thoroughly engaging. The characters were well thought out and I really felt the impact that they had on each other as well as the weight of their own decisions. The book primarily follows a young cast but I still found it to be a philosophical and thought-provoking read. The pacing in this book is also phenomenal. When I think back on it and the amount of ideas that were packed into this book, I'm always surprised when I remember that it's only 300 pages long. And all of this culminates with an ending that absolutely nails the landing. I think this is the type of book you can pick up as a young reader and get a lot out of it, and then try it again a few years later and find even more for you to unpack. Number three, Cat's Cradle by Kurt Vonnegut. In Cat's Cradle, Dr. Felix Honecker has left a deadly legacy to the world. Ice-9, a chemical capable of freezing the entire planet. The search for its whereabouts leads to a crazed dictator in the Caribbean. Kurt Vonnegut is one of my favourite writers, and Slaughterhouse-Five and The Sirens of Titan were two other books of his that I also considered for this list. To me, Cat's Cradle is both one of his funniest books and also one of his most poignant. It's endlessly quotable and one of a rare handful of books that has actually made me laugh out loud. Vonnegut tackles themes to do with free will, death, religion, and the dangers of technology, and he does so in a completely absurd way. Vonnegut writes in such a personal manner. He explores some of life's most profound questions, and it feels like a casual conversation with an observant friend, where he's like, this is weird, right? And as the reader, we're thinking, I'm so glad you said that. Yes, I feel the same way. Cat's Cradle helped me make just a little bit more sense out of a seemingly nonsensical world. Number two, Permutation City by Greg Egan. Permutation City is the story of a man with a vision. Immortality, for those who can afford it, is found in cyberspace. This is a hard sci-fi cyberpunk novel that is more focused on the cyber than the punk. It's less about a CD dystopian future and more about really diving into the existential depths of virtual reality. This book is packed with awesome sci-fi concepts to do with artificial intelligence, clones, time relativity, and immortality. 
It really questions some assumptions that I have about the universe, as well as the way I view physics. I definitely didn't understand all of the science, but I think if you just let it wash over you, you can pick up enough in order to follow the story, and what a story it is. There were a number of twists and turns where I thought, well, now I have to read the next chapter. And then I'd read the next chapter and think, well, I can't stop here. I can't remember a time where I was more excited to pick up a book. And number one, House of Sons by Alistair Reynolds. In House of Sons, Abigail Gentian clones herself 999 times, and these shadowlings then spread out across the universe. They then get together around every 200,000 years for a reunion. So around 6 million years in the future, when getting together for their 32nd reunion, the Gentian line is attacked. But they don't know by whom, and they don't know why. Off the bat, this is an insane premise, and I love it. I think of all the science fiction authors that I've read, Alistair Reynolds and Stephen Baxter are the only two that have attempted to tell a story on such an unfathomable scale. The book alternates between the perspectives of two different shadowlings, as well as including some flashbacks to the original Abigail Gentian. It's really interesting to see these characters that are almost identical, but still different, and how they interact with each other. And the number of sci-fi concepts in this book is awesome. Around every 50 pages or so, Reynolds would introduce something new that just absolutely blew me away, and I couldn't wait to get to the next one. And these concepts serve to elaborate on the central mystery, and heighten the action. There's a chase scene in this book between spaceships that takes place over tens of thousands of years, and I felt like I was on the edge of my seat the entire time. This is a relatively hard sci-fi book about clones and machine people, yet it still builds towards a touching ending, and it's my all-time favorite sci-fi book. So there you go guys, we made it. Those are my top 25 personal favorite science fiction books. Let me know some of your favorites in the comments. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, subscribe. It's free, and you can find more sci-fi content over here.